Hi again, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act Two. As you can see, Art and I are with our favorite mystery author, J.A. <laughs> Jantz. J.A., great to see you again. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm I'm really pleased. It's number 66. 66? I thought you were over 70. No, people sometimes count the the novellas, but those I have counted on my fingers. Oh, right. And <laughs> this Blessing of the Lost Girls is number 66. And as yes. of 824 p.m. last Thursday evening, the next Beaumont book, Beaumont number 27 and 26, Den of Iniquity, was in the can. So I am really... I'm still employed, but I have to, I have to say this to you right now. I never see this unless I'm sitting doing a Zoom event, and the picture across the room from me is yeah. crooked. Oh, that's but funny. The Zooms get over. I never think to go over and see. Yeah, well, don't get up and fix it now, okay? okay. By the way, JA sixty six. Does that include my one of my favorites? After the fire, your book of poetry, which you know I absolutely love, and I. I have to show it. Anybody who's a fan of yours who hasn't read this, okay, yeah. as soon as I finish watching this, get onto Amazon and order a copy. It's one of it's one of the most beautiful pieces of work, especially for young women who've been told they can't. And that's all I'm gonna say about it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. They can't, it'll never work. Don't do right. it. <laughs> right. Okay. But but you can you can be J. A. Jans if yeah. you believe in yourself. That's okay. right. So let's go so, to the book. Uh, let me, but, yeah, let me jump forward and and okay. talk about this book, the the new book, Blessings of the Lost Girls. Mm. Um, if for those people that don't know you, JA, you've got what four or five characters, each of which has a list of novels that you've written about them. So there's J.P. Beaumont, uh, the Seattle detective, uh, uh, Ali oh. Reynolds, the oh. uh, Arizona cyber detective uh joanna brady the um is sheriff it she's county she's a sheriff um and then there's a walker family yes and in this novel you bring together which by the way you've done kind of done with other novels but very very infrequently um i think jp bowman and ali reynolds mixed in a novel one time that was pretty good and Joanna um, Brady and J.P. Beaumont. Yep. Right. No. Yep. And yeah. this actually, one... actually, actually, from this fanboy, you know, this is the sixth crossover. Oh, okay. really? I, yeah. I wasn't counting. Yep. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Art. Thank I you have, for back up me. I, I, have, I have my Jansen order. Oh, my God. Four, <laughs> and I have them numbered, and uh, that's why I thought it was 73. But I included <laughs> the novellas. <laughs> well, the novellas are only half a novel each, you know. That let's, was, get that's, back, let's, 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 let's get back to this amazing book. Hey, John, you want to finish up? <laughs> I was just going to say that in this novel, which you don't do very often, you mix two of your characters, the, the Walker family. Um, I always want to say Brandon Walker, but he's an earlier character in the Walker family. And uh, Joanna Brady. And... It's a wonderful. I, is this the first time you've mixed those two characters together? Those two storylines. Yes, this is the first time, and it's it's actually Brandon Waters, Brandon Walker's son-in-law, Dan Pardee, Pardee right, you know. takes center stage in this right. book. Yeah. I, it's, um, and it was, it was so easy to join, to join those two up. I was able to make the. The timelines work. When I try to do crossover books, it's all that's always a really difficult part of the puzzle to get the timelines from the two separate series to align. And this time, this time it really worked. I, if if you don't mind, I'd like to tell a little about the process. Yes, because love to hear that. It's it's really magical in. Uh, the last Ali Reynolds book I wrote, Blessing of the Lost Girl, uh, uh, Collateral Damage, took a whole year to write. Now I started my I started writing my first published book in 1983. So I've been I've been writing books at the rate of 1.6 books a year 
for 40 years. Wow. So collateral damage was an exception. And it usually takes me about six months from the time I started until it's in New York and in the, the uh, editing process. Pleasant, it, collateral damage was an outlier on that because it took a whole year from March of 2021 to March of 2022. And that book just really seemed to drag along. I finally, I had written about a third of it and I handed it over to my husband and I said, would you please read this and tell me what you think? And what he told me is, this is a mess, I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right, it was a mess. And so what I had to do was go back to the beginning and bring the bad guy into focus in the book. And so I could use a lot of what I had already written, but I had to put it together in a different way. So while I was struggling with that book for that whole bloody year, I started thinking, boy, maybe I've lost my mo mojo. Maybe I'll never write another book. Maybe this is the last book I'll ever write, blah, blah, blah. But finally, with the help of my literary engineer, that my husband used to be an electronics engineer. Now he's oh. my literary engineer. <laughs> with his help, I finally got the book finished and people like it. So there you are. Yeah. But while I was writing that book, in about June of 2021, so I was just really in the middle of the struggle where the book wasn't going anywhere, I received a phone call from a friend of mine. She is a fan in Oregon who became a friend, and she called to report on something that had happened. In the 90s, there was a serial killer roaming the West, and he was called the boxcar killer. He rode trains and he liked to push Native Americans under moving trains. Mm. So at some point in the 90s, and by the way, he's in prison on five life without parole convictions. But in the in the 90s, he was in, there was a man in Oregon named James who was working in the rail yard. He was a rosebud Sioux. In his encounter with the boxcar killer, he was pushed under a train, dragged for a mile and a half. Uh, when the engineer finally stopped the train, law enforcement was called. He was pronounced dead at the scene. He was zipped into a body bag and shipped off to the morgue. One of the morgue was in the hospital of the basement of the community hospital. And one of the nurses who was also of Sioux descent that evening when she got off shift, she went down to the morgue to wash his hair. When she unzipped the body bag, his arm came out because oh he wasn't dead. So he went from the morgue to the operating room for the first of countless surgeries it took to sort of duct tape him back together. Um, and he ended up losing his right hand. So he had to learn to use his left hand. He had to learn to speak again. He had to learn to read again. And while he was undergoing all those hospital stays, my friend Loretta, who volunteered in the hospital where he was being treated, uh, read books to him before he learned to read again. And because her two kids are half indigenous, she loves the Walker books. And so she read the Walker books to him. So James recovered enough. He was a paraplegic, of course, but he recovered enough that he was able to live more or less independently. And he spent the last 20 years of his life working with disenfranchised urban Indian youth, trying to get them on the right path. Mm. Shortly before his death in, 19, in 2021, he called my friend Loretta and he said, tell your friend Judy to write another Walker book. 
there aren't enough Indian heroes. Mm. And when you meet, when you read Blessing of the Lost Girls oh. and meet John Wheeler. Yes. No. Yes. James wanted more Indian heroes, and now by God, he is one. But when it was when it was time to write that book, when I was done with collateral damage, I knew it would be a Walker book. I knew it would be about murdered and missing indigenous women, but I couldn't come up with a title. I spent three nights tossing and turning, trying to figure one out. I finally went to my literary engineer and said, I need a title for this book. It needs to sound like a Walker book, but it needs to have a little twist to it. He thought about it for all of two minutes. And then he said, how about Blessing of the Lost Girls? Hmm. Well, I started writing that book the next morning and I wrote that book beginning to end in two months flat. Wow. Wow. So that's, that's kind of uh, uh, it's really amazing. My first couple of questions you just answered, okay? Because <laughs> people, it's an amazing book. And I, when, when John and I finished reading the book, John said, well, what do you think? I said, I, there are so many great books. It's, yeah. You're a New York Times bestseller author. I almost think this was the best one ever, although I know it's not because there are so many good ones. And he said, why? And so I'm going to pose this question to you. One of the things that's so special about this is one of the characters that we've been following in the Joanna Brady series is her daughter, Jennifer. And Jennifer is, this is like a coming of age of Jennifer. To right. me, yes, uh, Dan Pardee and Joanna Brady to a lesser extent in this particular, but it's Jennifer Brady who is a, uh, uh, she's taking She's criminal side. Yes. She's at, and so she is, she is part of, a integral part of helping Dan Pardee solve the mystery which people can read about. And I just thought it was such a beautiful way to, you know, is there going to be a Jennifer Brady series? <laughs> because... How long am I going to keep writing? I don't know. But the thing is, when I started writing the Joanna Brady books, Years ago, in that first book, Desert Heat, Jenny was nine years old. She had just had a little bit. It was the evening of her folks' 10th wedding anniversary. And Jennifer has just had a little teeny tiny bit of sex education at Bisbee's Greenway School. And she has counted on her fingers. Whoops, not quite enough months between this anniversary and my birthday. And so, in that first scene, she asks with Joanna's mother present in the room, she asks, was I a preemie? Yeah. <laughs> of course, she wasn't a preemie. The wedding was late. Yeah. But, but to see her evolve over the years has been, has been really interesting to me. And of course, we, the audience, actually attended that barrel race in New Mexico yes. years earlier. Yes. That the first victim of the serial killer in Blessing is is murdered. Yeah. So the, speaking, yeah. I'll have a connection to that book, that character. Yeah. Okay, but without further discussing it, keep in mind when you read the book Barrel Racing, because yes. there's going to be some real amazing surprises about barrel racing, really? Her and her? And yeah. so uh, it's just the way you weave that. It, I mean, it's pure J.A. Jance. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but, you know, J.A., as much as I really, and with along with Art, really enjoyed the fact that Jennifer um, goes from being the child of a main character, Joanna, the sheriff, to now she's in college and studying, guess what? Uh, criminal science. Uh, he started doing that at the end of the last Joanna Brady book. Mm -hmm. She's yep. yep. And now she gets involved in a mystery. And in a way, it's Joanna doesn't even know what's going on. Her daughter works with Dan Pardee. So and for me, what, what I loved was 
not only is Joanna coming, growing up and coming forward and becoming a, a full-blown character, but there's a, now a family history that's starting to look like the Walker family. And in the beginning of this book, because the Walker family is a Native American um, family on the reservation, you worked on the reservation, you have, you bring a lot of personal um, recollections to the story. But the Walker family, you in the beginning of the book, you put in a, a uh, what do you call it, a, a family tree. So we can yeah. trace back who everybody is. The first Walker family book, Hour of the Hunter, had an Alaska timeline that stretched over 70 years. Yes. And there were characters that would be in the early 1900s and characters that were. So that family tree was actually created by one of my friend, one of my fans. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I can't well, Great to see. Head. She put it on paper. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I have to compliment you because you are very, very good. All of your books uh, have this quality. And that is that you introduce a character or you flash back to that character's previous something or other, and you give us enough information so that if I haven't read the other books, I don't right. get lost. I still understand. I have a real good understanding of who these people are, where they come from, where they're going. But if you have read those other books, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, detail, levels of meaning to all the books. To but have it's also that history. It's also a way of not telling so much that the reader doesn't say, "Well, oh, you haven't read that book. Maybe I should read that book too." <laughs> <laughs> they really should. So I have another yeah. part, another another thing about the book that impressed me, and you've done this on numerous occasions in other books. Is you introduce uh, uh, something that most Americans have never heard of, most people in the world have never heard of, is things that are design, they're obscure, whether it be fingerprinting, uh, technology, uh, and you do it throughout all your books, you talk about the di various databases as they're growing up, uh, right. particularly Beaumont, things like that. But in this one, you introduce the uh, Missing or Murdered Indigenous Peoples Organization, which is a real organization, or there are, there are variations oh. of it. My organization is fictional, but there is at last a real organization doing that right the missing and murdered indigenous people are suddenly brand new on the landscape of the media but they've been present from time immemorial from the time i was on the reservation there i knew about those things and actually the first walker book hour of the hunter deals with a murdered young Tahona Autumn woman yes. whose killer is caught due to, to Brandon Walker's efforts, but he gets a slap on the wrist. He's a member of the elite. He's a, he's a former professor of creative writing from the yes. University of Arizona, so he sort of gets a walk. And so I've been writing about that for a long time, but this this was the first time when I set out to write a book about that. I, I because I just finished writing a different book, just before we went on the air, I went back to Blessing and looked at the name file because my name my head is full right now of all the people in the Beaumont book, and I needed to suddenly get my head full of all the people in the Walker book, <laughs> but. Um, my favorite scene in this book is <laughs> totally unrelated to the whole action, but it's when uh, Deborah, the young woman who escaped the killer, only because she was going out to do the dirty in a stall in a barn with a not so nice boyfriend. And when she was attacked, the not so nice boyfriend saved her bacon. And uh, 
but she didn't want to tell her folks anything about this because she knew how much they would disapprove of the boyfriend. Yeah. Oops. Looks like we lost John, you know, just like live TV, we see it all the time. Uh, so, J.A., would you continue on with, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, Jenny and Deborah. When Jenny convinces Deborah that what happened to her isn't just about her, it's about other girls as well, she finally realizes that she needs to actually tell her parents about what happened. <clears throat> and so when she goes to do that, her father is out of town. She tells her mother and she's always, her father is an academic and he's sort of distant and she's always regarded him as sort of this, sort of as the villain of the piece. Mm. And in the process of that conversation, her mother reveals that when she was gen when she was her daughter's age, she was the victim of a sexual assault and that Deborah's father stood by her. Mm -hmm. And in that conversation, the mother tells Deborah, when you go looking okay. for another boyfriend, look for one who's boring. Look for one, somebody who will get a steady job and bring his paychecks home. Don't look for the flashy guy. Look for the guy who's steady. And when I wrote that, when I wrote that scene and when I reread that scene, it gave me goosebumps because it's advice that I wish I had had someone tell me when I was that age. <laughs> mm. But you are, you are in fact, uh, sharing your, your life story and the way it interweaves uh, uh, with uh, all of the books, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Ali uh, Reynolds and but uh, I, I think uh, uh, Joanna Brady, especially with the Bisbee connection where uh, you grew up uh, and you, you are constantly bringing in things that empower the particularly women, but anybody who feels as if they've been uh, tossed aside or taken advantage of because you have been and you've overcome it. And that's why and I'm gonna plug it again if I can, why one of my favorite pieces of yours is this beautiful book because it was written mo mostly when you were in the <laughs> outs. You, you, you did it. You did it when you were feeling low and you didn't feel you were being told you can't do this and you can't do that. And quite frankly, from my standpoint, you were being abused and you're basically telling people, particularly women, you don't need to settle for that. You're better well, than that. After the fire <laughs> is the story of my journey <clears throat> with my first husband who died mm -hmm. of <clears throat> chronic alcoholism at age 42. So he, he missed half his life because he I gave him a choice between me or booze and he chose booze. But there was one Sunday in Phoenix when I came home from church when he had covered the doorknobs of the house with olive oil because someone had told him that would drive the evil spirits out of the house. And so I told him to go take a nap. And he did. I found, I found him later asleep on the bed with an open Playboy magazine in front of him. Hmm. I went out to the backyard. I went through the house and I searched out all his hidden bottles of booze. And then I went into the backyard and one at a time, I threw them against the wall of the house and spilling booze and shattered glass all over the yard. And then I went in and wrote this. The bottle shattered as it hit the wall. I stood up with arm up raised and knew that I had smashed it. It could as easily have been his head. <clears throat> The anger raged around me like a roaring flood. I wanted victims, and it wasn't hard to flush them from their hidden lairs. I broke the bottles one by one with cool deliberation. By the very act of breaking them, I certified their victory. I took him to the doctor then, not because he needed it. I did. 
I really did. I got him to get dressed. I got him to take a shower. He dressed, showered, dressed, and I checked him into a hospital because it was dangerous for him to be in the house when I was that crazy. Well, wow. those ones really were written when I was in the trenches. And I mm -hmm. think that's what makes them so immediate when people read them. Right. And, and, and for somebody like myself who never experienced these kinds of things and our family hasn't, uh, I know many have, and, uh, and I'm not a poem kind of guy, but this book has, which is why almost in every conversation we have, I bring it up to you of how important it is because it's so beautifully written. So what I'd like to do now is we're here to talk about your current yeah. stuff. Blessings of the Lost Girls is available in September. You can order from Amazon now. I've seen it online. Uh, and it's a wonderful read. As I said, if it wasn't for the fact that you have so many good books, it's because of the coming of age of uh, Jennifer Brady that, uh, uh, and the way you handled that, that it become one of my favorite. And uh, I do urge everybody again, in uh, down below uh, in the description will be a uh, link to jajance.com. Read the about me, read the blog. Well, You're just going to have lots of fun. And the last word is yours. What would you like to say to our audience? Well, my publisher is setting up an actual tour this this year. It's not not all the pieces are in place yet. As soon as they are, the schedule will be posted on the blog. And I really love going on tour. I really love interacting with real live people in an audience. So I'm I'm excited about that. That's and wonderful. I actually think that Blessing is going to bring me a whole new generation of readers because I think it's a powerful book. I agree. And anyway, uh, for John, who's not here, you know that we are your two biggest fanboys. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and we look forward to uh, 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 talking to you about your next book and in between if you just want to call and and chat uh, we could do that with the cameras on or without because we we always love speaking with you so thank you for taking the time and uh, sharing your thoughts with us and we look forward to seeing you again soon thank you thank you very much for more on celebrating act two visit our webpage follow us on facebook subscribe to us on youtube and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.